They're in YouTube land. Give me a, uh, give me, give me a, hey, hey, Ryan Jackson, David Engelhart, uh, Dan, Don Ganeer, Doug Hostetler. If you guys can hear me, give me some thumbs up. All that jazz. Just make sure we're, uh, I believe we are, we are good to go. And Jerry, welcome to Modernization Week. Hey, Tom, thanks for having me. This is, uh, this is awesome and exciting. Yeah, I'm pumped about it. So all week we're going to be talking modernization and, um, I know we have a we have a really good lineup, and and you know this is a this is a good timing because uh, we're in the middle of the uh, between the first draft and second draft of the National Electrical Code, and um, uh, you know reconditioned equipment, all that good stuff gets a lot of attention, and I know we're going to dispel all that good stuff. Don Ganier gave me, a, and Ryan says audio and video are good, so we're out there. Awesome. <laughs> so so jerry why don't we do this why don't we just start yeah. well you know in, in, from a welcome perspective what, i don't i doubt anybody out there knows who you are so why don't you give your give a little introduction to yourself awesome awesome yeah well thanks uh thanks everybody whoever's uh who's listening uh my name is jerry danish i'm the director for switchgear modernization uh here at eaton so i've been with eaton uh, about 12 years uh 22 years of experience electrical experience I uh, graduated from Michigan Tech, so shout out to any Huskies out there, and uh, been been in services my entire my entire career. Uh, put put it that way. So I was a field service engineer for uh, a couple of different companies, and uh, got into uh, some operational management roles, and now the director for Switchgear uh, Modernization here at Eaton. So again, thank you, and I uh, look forward to uh, a wonderful week of talking about Switchgear Modernization and what we can do for our customers. Excellent, excellent. So um, yeah. you say you've been out in the field for. Uh... For a while now so so what's your what's your background is it electrical mechanical what's your background? Yeah, electrical electrical, yeah, electrical. yep yep so i did 13 years as a field service engineer so i started off my career in michigan and then uh um you know kind of one of those stories got married and you know moved to pennsylvania and then uh got a got a position with uh with eaton uh back in 2006 actually. 2006 cool beans. yeah yeah yep yep Cool. So, 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 um, so modernization, you know, I, I, I was watching earlier a video on that topic and I know you and I had chatted on email with regard to uh, like, why would you want to modernize uh, your equipment? I mean, I know there's a lot of financial stuff associated with, you know, you've got low voltage assemblies, you got big gray boxes that you can't just rip out and put a new one in. Right. Right. So, so, and I know there's the financial side, but what about what, what are other reasons somebody would say I'm going to recondition or, or is, is that a, a fair word to use reconditioning? Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's a, there's a bunch of terminologies, right? So you can do reconditioning, retro fits, uh, retro fills, um, and just general kind of renovation of your switch gear. That's kind of the word we like to use is renovation, right? Renovation. So, yeah. So what's uh so, so really it's geared to, um, any uh, in, in industry out there, right? So you're thinking of hospitals, universities, data centers, utilities, right? So the electrical infrastructure is the heartbeat of your system. It really is, right? And, um, you know, yesterday in Pittsburgh, we had some really bad storms that came through. Yep. And, you know, so I know so a couple of my friends lost powers to their house, right? So what do you do when you lose power? Well, you kind of do nothing unless you got, you know, full uh, generation backup and stuff like that. So you're kind of stuck, right? Now you take a look at businesses, the same thing. It's, you know, you lose power, you know, and how much dollars, you know, we're going to try to stay away from the financial talk, but it, it is the reality of it is that you need a reliable power system to make sure your power stays on. So you're not losing, you know, any, any manufacturing process, any data centers, um, any critical oh, components yeah. of your company. Right. So it's, it's a big, big focus uh, for my group. Yeah. Right. So, so you, we, you know, you, I mean, I've been watching the news all morning and I, and I've got friends uh, down in Louisiana and whatnot that are experiencing the hurricane that's coming through. Right. So, you know, that's a point of discussion, water damaged equipment uh, and things like that. So, so let's talk just a little bit about that one, because since it's, I think, um, I think it's pertinent to exactly what people are experiencing right now. What, I mean, do you, in your history and in your experience, water damaged equipment, is that something that you work with when, or, or is that something you say you got to stay away from trying to recondition or refurbish water damage, like low voltage assemblies and things like that? Yeah, it's just a combination, right? So water damage gear or, you know, gear is experienced water damage. Um, you know, it's just a couple different forms. One is, 
you know, typically the steel, you know, the, the copper bus, um, you oh, know, yeah. those, those components are, are savable, right? Uh, it was just when you get into electronics, that's, that's, that's the tough part, right? So a lot of the circuit breakers, you know, you can recondition a circuit breaker. Mm -hmm. So you take it like, you know, what's, what's going down in Louisiana off of the hurricanes, you know, obviously there's going to be, you know, more likely water damaged uh, switch gear and components, right? The reconditioning of circuit breakers can, you know, happen pretty fast um, versus, you know, brand new circuit breakers, right? So that's one of the benefit of modernization is we can recondition a circuit breaker really, really quick. Getting the electrical components for it so that solid state trip unit or whatever that may be is typically those are not salvageable from uh, from water damage. However, you're only replacing a small component on that uh, that piece of equipment instead of the whole thing, which could cost you know, more downtime, um, you know, we, we try to bring that lead time to a minimum to, to get uh, those components back into the field into your electrical system. Now, when you say circuit breaker, right, I, I think we've got to make sure we clarify here because uh, there are a lot of people out there that will think molded case circuit breakers, and that's what I typically picture. But I know where your head's at. Your head's are on the big stuff, right? The big boys. Exactly, exactly. So you're talking about, you know, the 13, uh, you know, the 15 kV level, the 5 kV level down to the 480, you know, 12208. Yeah. Right. So if everyone's thinking like, hey, in your, your housing panel, little circuit breakers. Yeah, typically that's that stuff we touch. We're, we're, you know, we're looking at, you know, the big circuit breakers, a couple hundred pounds, um, you know, things that cost a lot, a lot of money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and um, I know uh, NEMA puts out a document on reconditioned uh, equipment. And uh, they specify things that, that you can recondition and even water damaged uh, type of discussion. You can bring power circuit breakers, medium voltage circuit breakers back up to speed and up to date because you basically you tear the whole thing apart when you're when you're reworking it. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple a couple different levels to class one or uh, reconditioning uh, circuit breakers and there's a class one, class two and class three. And it, it really depends on, you know, our assessment of the breaker and what the customer wants. Um, so a class three is a, a quick overview. I'm going to say quick overview, but kind of a quick overview, fast track, uh, you know, get it through the process and get it right. qualified and tested. And the class one is a full blown teardown of, uh, of the circuit breaker. Um, and we replace co components. We, uh, uh, replate items. Uh, we may upgrade trip units. Uh, do, you know, it all depends, uh, Again, kind of what the customer is looking for and also, you know, based off our recommendations, too. Yeah. So so this was a, I, I, I peeled this off of a, a video that we were doing and this is your class one. Right. So and and yep. now that, that right there real quick. I mean, what. What what he's showing here is is the the, the breaker that that they're taking apart is sitting on the table and he's got all of the mechanisms completely out of that breaker. And then um, here, I know what that is. That's a sandblaster, right? Yep, you got it. So, so, so when when people talk about, I, and I've heard this before, and I know this is a fact that when you get water water intrusion in, inside, or even smoke like smoke damage or fire damage, you'll get the soot. You'll get all of the stuff that's in that water, which could be oils and chemicals and all that good stuff. And you can't, you can't just like, uh, you know, you can't get your, uh, what do they call that uh, green or your, uh, your Dawn dishwash soap and, and wash it off. Right. It's not like a duck. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we, it looks like they actually get into, um, uh, you know, sandblasting. And then I saw another uh, media, uh, they were turning, um, and I love this this one here, this picture here, because when when you're re, this is would you call this a level one? Yeah, that's a class one. Yep, class one, full full tear down and full rebuild. So I mean, it's like all of the materials. It's it's you're basically remanufacturing this circuit breaker if you think about it. Exactly, exactly. That's that's what it's all about. It is tearing that circuit breaker apart, rebuilding it, and it's almost getting like a brand new breaker back. Yeah, and testing of it. Uh, I mean, you look at those uh, arc extinguishers there, they're like brand new. And oh, and there's the other, the other thing is you're not just dealing with Eaton or Cutler Hammer, you're dealing with third party equipment, right? So from a services division perspective, and I know you guys, and I've been with Eaton for I don't know, 25 years since 95, whatever it was. Right. And then I've, and I've, I've watched, and I remember when we, when we uh, acquired or no, we didn't acquire, 
We used to work with Westinghouse Engineering Services a lot. And then uh, Westinghouse was purchased by Siemens. Yep. And then we created our own service division. And I remember when that uh, when that when that occurred and um, and and our services division, you know, I worked I worked for services for one day. Do you know that? (laughs) No, I (laughs) I did. I did. I worked for (laughs) it was was the best day of your career. It was the best day of my whole career. Gary Gates, (laughs) Gary Gates hired me. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I was offered another role within Eaton at the same, that same first day I looked at Dave Giannimo was my boss. I said, Dave, I just, I mean, today's my first day. And he's like, we want you to do this. I'm like, so I had to go up to Gary Gates and I had to tell him that I, I, and he already, I think they, they set me up. I don't know, but, um, (laughs) but, but services really prides himself in the fact that it's like a third party group almost. I mean, they they're tied to the manu- to a manufacturer which is which is very healthy and good, but we can do a lot of work outside of um, outside of just our products. Yep, yep, ex- exactly right, Tom. Yeah, we uh, uh, you know, we kind of take the stance that we'll, you know, obviously, you know, our breakers first and Eaton legacy breakers, yep. but also we get into all the uh, you know, kind of the third party um, you know, manufacturers. And even on top of that, you know, like the trip units and protective systems, um, you know, depending on that's, that's the great thing about our, our organization is whatever the customer specifies, uh, we can typically go out and, and purchase and, and build around that specification. Yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty cool. So so let me ask you. Um, we know we're talking power circuit breakers, but what about the enclosure? What can we do? With the actual physical structure, the big gray box, so to speak, mm-hmm. what's the level of, of, of capabilities in reconditioning or refurbishing or, or what'd you call it? You call it reno- renovating, right? Renovating. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I, I use, I use this big, like a uh, house analogy, but I won't get into, uh, but to, to, you know, go through your question, uh, is we can do this. This is the great thing about our group reverse, like replacing your switch gear is your switch gear. If you decide to replace it, that means you are ripping out old switch gear and you're replacing with brand new, right? Yeah. That's, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of cost. That's a lot, you know, like downtime um, and a lot of other costs that you just don't recognize. And going to our group, we can, it's very selectable. So if you're taking a look at a lineup of switch gear, um, whether it be medium voltage or low voltage, to say you like, hey, my breakers are really old and I just want to get replacement breakers. We have a solution for that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have to uh, say, well, you know, our protective uh, scheme, old electrical mechanical relays, they're, they're old and we want to go all digital. And we can, we have a solution for that. We get into some of the environmental things. So old, old switch gear that has a, asbestos arc shoots or asbestos wiring. Um, right. We can replace all that. So we have a solution for that. So if you take a look at, uh, like, like you said, the, the big gray box, um, typically we can replace 99% of that and bring it up to all today's standards, almost brand new condition. Um, we have a couple of case studies of that where we have renovated uh, you know, switch gear and we replaced everything in it except for the structural steel and the bus bar. Oh, really? Yep. Okay, so oh, absolutely. All right, so so the stru- now now I think that's an important thing where you say the structural steel and the bus bar that's inside that all remains, but you can replace everything else. Have you everything ever ha- have you ever been or is it are you able to replace bus bar inside that equipment or does that get to an area where it gets kind of um, touchy with what you can and can't do to the actual physical structure? Yeah, it gets it gets touchy. We have uh, several, a couple of cases where we've uh, increased the capacity, uh, amperage, and also uh-huh. uh, bus bracing studies to increase the uh, the interrupting uh, fault levels. Okay, the yeah. short circuit current rating. Okay, that yep. that's pretty cool. Yep, that's yep. cool. So 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 yeah. there's a because you, you we know you can't do physical testing. Um, and short circuit current ratings, I, I can imagine that being a challenge, especially going from uh, what the the available fault currents used to be to what they are today, because the utility makes changes and all this other good stuff, right? So now yeah, you've got to you've got to think about bracing of that. So it is it, it's comforting to know that um, th- that it's not. Um, I guess you would say it's not out of the picture or out of the uh, the scope, but if a if somebody said, look, I have a short circuit current rating issue with my equipment, 
there are some things that could possibly be done, but I'm sure you would probably have to come in and say, you know, what level of, um, what level you can achieve, right? Right, right. And you, and you, uh, you, you hit it, right? It all starts with the utility. And a lot of our customers yeah. are just, you know, they don't, they don't know when the utility makes a change to their system, uh, they're typically not informed uh, from the utility about, you know, the, those changes, right? So their switch gear could be overdutied. Um, yeah. And then, like you said, you know, we do have solutions to help our customers if, you know, if they do need increased, uh, you know, short circuit rating uh, or even increasing the opacity in their, their bus bar. Yeah. Okay. And you said you had some case studies. Is that something that's online? Or uh, no, we don't. That's that's uh, we don't have them online. But that's uh, that's a great point um, that we should have some of that stuff out there. Yeah, uh, yeah, to, yeah. That'd be to, awesome. You know, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yep. 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 And if you and if you get that done, I'll be the first one to start sharing them. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So um, so maintenance. So so I, and I've and I've read this. I said uh, I was uh, as I was editing a video this morning which I never do. And I hate doing, I absolutely hate editing with, but cause I stink at it. But, um, the, the person who was talking on it talked about extending equipment lifespan up to 30 years or a 10 year, 10,000 operation maintenance. These are all numbers, uh, that are associated with the maintenance of equipment and the longevity. So you could take yes. an, you could take an old piece of equipment and extend the life of that equipment the 30 years is that right did i hear that right that's, that's yeah that's right that's, that's exactly pretty, it yeah that's yeah. pretty cool so 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 one one key thing is like you know the questions um anyone out there or customers or you know uh you know not trying to you know train sales people out there that may be listening but really the first question is like how old is your electrical system that that's it right mm -hmm. there's guidance out there to say hey what's the useful life of electrical equipment and typically the rule of thumb is 20 to 30 years uh depending on, on you know what electrical component it is and then you get, you get into these uh, these other questions like, hey, has it been maintained? You know, that 20, 30 years is kind of a baseline. Uh, could it be, you know, could those be extended? Absolutely. You know, good maintenance plan, uh, program, sure. um, environmental controls. Um, but the flip side of it is you know, that 20, 30 years can be, you know, kind of collapsed to, you know, 10 to 15, depending on how you treat your electrical equipment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and NFPA 70B is in Bob is our maintenance document that we use from an industry perspective. I call that a part of the trilogy. You got the National Electrical Code is 70, 70E is safe work practices, and 70B is your maintenance. And that's moving to a standard now. So it's coming from a document that says, you know, you could, you should, and, and you know, we would recommend to a you shall document, which I think is critical. Um, but to your point, maintenance is critical for uh, for, for just the longevity of the equipment, but it, it's also a very important piece from a safety perspective. And yes, and you made a comment earlier, and I and I I read this as well that um, that you can equip equipment that it's old with new technologies like arc reduction maintenance technologies or zone selective interlocking, right? Uh, yep. All of these new technologies that help reduce the uh, severity of an arc flash event. Uh, I, I'm sure you can probably add barriers where, where we can put barriers in equipment and things of that nature to provide some um, uh, protection for the worker. But the electrical worker, I think, is a, it, it plays on the importance of providing a safer environment for the electrical worker, I think, plays an important role for another reason for modernizing outside of the cost, just the cost. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And safety is number one out there, right? Yep. Uh, protect our, our, our electric workers or maintenance um, professionals that may be, you know, interacting with the switch gear. Um, and that's engineering controls, right? So depending on what the customer specifies up front, uh, we have a bunch of different solutions uh, from incorporating arc flash relays to, you know, uh, remote or not remote. Yeah. Well, remote, you know, mimic panels where, you know, yep. you can operate breakers, uh, you know, separate from the switch gear up to uh, remote racking devices now. Uh, so the technology has, has changed um, a lot over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years to start putting all these safety solutions you know, in the switch gear to, you know, just to do that, protect our, our workers out there. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and um, the, I, I, I like the remote and you mentioned, you just said mimic, mimic uh, panels. Right. And I had, yep. uh, I had another gentleman on from, um, I think it was CBS arc safe. I think they, I can't remember what, 
Uh, yeah, he, 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 they were, it was the chicken switches is, is, was his claim to fame. Right. <laughs> and, and I love, I just love the name chicken switch. Right. But, but he mentioned that I think it was DuPont or uh, one of those organizations did a lot of the mimic uh, panel where they would at the end of the equipment m- make sure that you can get the electrical worker out of harm's way and do that now we can do that electronically which with right behind me a, a, you know a display like that on the equipment or out in the in the hallway right yes. where they have the one line diagram you can open and close uh, over these breakers remotely yep and all of that it could be a part of the modernization uh, no uh, modernization but uh renovation of your electrical renovation. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we, and we're, we're seeing that a lot more. And like, like, again, it's also an education piece too, is the customers don't know that these solutions are out there. And as soon as yeah. you bring it to their attention and say, Hey, we can protect your electrical workers. You know, we can, you know, you can operate your breaker from outside the room. Right. And then give yeah. you communication or, you know, the biggest thing now is, you know, we're, we're all on this digitalization road uh, path. Yeah. Right. Uh, yep. So you talk about, you know, remote operation uh, through digital, you know, uh, devices and, um, you know, the and controls from either your computer or, uh, you know, there's there's some Wi-Fi enabled uh, devices out there nowadays, too. So, there, <laughs> yeah. And that brings yeah. up that brings up another hot topic uh, in the code. We're talking about cybersecurity. Yeah. OK, so now you add technology and and I think I think it's really important that whoever is adding the technology, when you start getting devices that communicate, that can be connect to a, a local area network, whether it be wirelessly or hardwired, you've got to look, you've got to approach it with an eye on cyber security because there are a lot of people out there who just love to hack in and do things, right? And 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 it could be a critical, it could it, could be a critical part of um, from a national security perspective, or it could just be uh, what do they call that um, espionage? Or, you know, the whole yeah. concept of I'm just gonna I'm gonna see if I can wreak havoc at a whatever facility it is, especially if it's a data center, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's uh, that's a growing concern uh, with with uh, with every all customers out there. And I'm I'm no cybersecurity expert on on that, and that's a whole different uh, yeah. show that you could probably touch on. But yeah, that is. Uh, you know, moving forward as we, you know, get into more of this, uh, you know, digital era uh, is that cybersecurity is going to be ult- ultimately uh, extremely important at everyone's radar. Exactly. And, and and I know that our services division does a lot of that as well. And uh, and we got Max Wandera out there who's out, you know, very engaged trying to steer that whole thing. But, but um, you know, remote monitoring, remote control capabilities, all of those things, and it just adds another layer of uh of, of complexity and importance from a safety perspective. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, so what were the other things? So, so we talked about, we talked about the whys, you know, we've got the, the cost of, uh, you know, you just, you just don't, you just don't go down to home Depot or grab a new, a low voltage assembly or medium voltage piece of equipment, and slap it in. Right. right. Um, and, and, and the cost of buying, uh, of when do you, when do you, there's, there's a question. And I, and I thought about this a little bit earlier. When, when do you sit down and, and, and say, when is it not worth the reconditioning or the remanufacturing and, and you say, just buy a brand new breaker? I mean, there's got to be a point at which you say, this is either not salvageable or it's not worth your, your time and money to, um, to get it back up and running. Is there a, you, a point yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, so we'll, we'll touch on two things, right? So we'll talk about replacing the entire switchgear. Um, so switchgear modernization is not, you know, it's not for every situation out there. Mm-hmm. And typically, the small, you know, smaller, you know, one to two sections of switchgear, and it's easy accessible, and you know, the customer can take a long outage to replace it. You know, that that may be better suited for them. Um, you know, the when we get into individual circuit breakers, typically these are the old circuit breakers. And this just drives another conversation and point is, you know, you take a big electrical facility or an industrial facility that has, you know, they, you know, the idea is they started off small and they put in an electrical system, then they grew and put in more, you know, electrical products. And all of a sudden they have, you know, a bunch of different types of electrical equipment, low voltage, and medium right. voltage across a, you know, a slew of different manufacturers. And as this, you know, as we do, you know, reconditioning services, you know, there's a point where breakers need to get replaced, right? They just, they just wear up. 
And yep. the idea and the, the selling point is that, you know, you know, when you have a maintenance uh, maintenance crew is that they carry parts and pieces and inventory for all these different types of breakers. And, you know, the one of the selling point is like, what, you know, what if you could standardize on one breaker, right? So if you take a look, yeah. you know, big, yeah, big industrial facility, you can say, hey, you have all these different types of breakers and manufacturers. How about you standardize on one breaker and we can go through and do a replacement program for all your electrical infrastructure. That way you're carrying one breaker, you're carrying, you know, parts for one breaker or maybe two breakers, you know, medium below voltage. But, you know, parts are easy, uh, easily accessible. You can train your maintenance personnel how to change parts and do maintenance on circuit breakers and, you know, in case of critical need. And on top of that, you know, you can send them back to, you know, uh, you know, the PBRC to get them, you know, reconditioned class one, class two or class three, depending on what you need. So. So, OK, so so let me let me ask. I, I mean, that that brings up. a. <sighs> when I have in my in, in a facility. You and I both know, I mean, although I would never buy anything other than an eaten piece of equipment, every now <laughs> right. and then you get like, you know, the other guys, and you know, un unexpectedly uh, getting a sale there. So so what happens if I'm a facility that I have? I have, uh, you know, GE switch gear. I've got square D uh, switch switch gear, and then I've got Eaton switch gear. How do you standardize on one breaker when you have all the different manufacturers? Can you put, I mean, how, how do you handle that? I mean, can I put my breaker in someone else's switch gear? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you yep. can. Yeah. So IEEE um, uh, C37, you know, is the govern for documentation for, you know, uh, conversion of switch gear. C37.59? Right? Yes, you got it. Uh, okay. Yep, okay. Yep. So C37.59 lets me or gives me the rules that I can put my breaker into another piece of equipment. And is there an evaluation? I mean, I guess it, really, if you think about it, any one of this equipment, you have you have copper bus back there and, and, and you have an enclosure. So really what you're doing is a physical marrying of mounting a circuit breaker on bus. Well, it's not, so it, it's, a, it's, it's a couple of different parts to that, right? Okay. So there is a, a uh, where we do that type of service, uh, which is if we don't have a direct replacement breaker, then we'll go in, uh, we'll, we'll take out, you know, the, the old, uh, you know, device, we'll strip out the electrical bus bar, and then we'll rebuild it for that section. Okay. Okay. Um, what I'm talking about is, you know, direct replacement breakers where, you know, for medium voltage, we have over 250 designs for direct replacement breakers. So that is easy as grabbing someone's breaker, pulling it out and taking one of our breakers, sticking it right back in. Oh, 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 so, so your interface to the bus is exactly the same as the other manufacturers. Exactly. Yep. We ah. line up, we match one for one. Yep. Interesting. You got it. You got it. So okay. it makes so going yeah going back to the point. So if you're a large industrial facility, and you have a bunch of different manufacturers across the board uh, installed base. Yep. You know if you could standardize on one breaker, you know even even though the the, the physical makeup is different, all the mechanical parts and pieces, the vacuum bottles are all the same within the breaker, depending on the size. But you're you're standardizing right. on one manufacturer. Right. Yep. And then the trip units, right? So the other, the brain, right? So on any one of these breakers, you have a electronic trip unit that tells it when to trip and gives it its ground fault functions and its communication functions. That brain will be the same so that now you have that consistency and then you can communicate with those, bring it back to software. And, and yeah, yeah. So, so for low voltage, you're talking about low voltage breakers has the, uh, you know, that, that uh, intelligent device installed on the breaker itself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. So for medium voltage, for medium voltage breakers, there's a couple out there that do have that intelligent device uh, installed on them. Uh, but typically those are operated by the external relays. source, meaning your, yeah, your relays. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, gotcha. However, going back to the point, if you have an old install base where you have electrical mechanical relays, you know, we can replace those with style state or digital uh, relays. Okay. And that gives you the that gives you the ability to communicate to that device and control the breaker as as needed. OK, and that's what and that and when you think about a medium voltage lineup. You have the door is uh, is an important piece of the puzzle, right? Because on that door, it has all your meters, whether they be analog or relays. And, and, um, and, and so you can basically 
redo the door too and put all new relays and and replace all the analog with with digital and um and increase the and and, and that would interface with the existing breaker in there so you you probably could leave all of the physical hardware together and just change the doors out yeah oh yeah that's that's the the selectability of uh of modernization you know maybe your breakers are perfectly fine um and you just yeah. want to go to uh, you know a, a better device for control uh because a breaker is you know kind of kind of you know dumbing it down a breaker is kind of a dumb device uh for mm -hmm. medium voltage right it's just a mechanical device uh the brains behind it is what's on the door okay and what you do now do you do low voltage or are you primarily medium voltage uh, no, we do both. You do yeah, both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So typically low voltage, uh, they don't have that door component to it, right? right? So that intelligent device is actually installed on the low voltage circuit breaker. Right, right, right. Now on and and on the um on the door, you know, typically like in the low voltage applications, what you would see on the doors would be uh, any presence of voltage indicators, things like that. Um, but on the medium voltage, it gets much more extensive with regard to the, the the number of components that are on the door and you can you can take all of those off reinterface that use the you wouldn't have to rewire the structure you would use the existing in you know wires right yeah we can do both we can either rewire it uh depending on <clears throat> the application right so if you're looking at sure. differential relaying and stuff like that or taking you know cts from a remote location obviously oh, that gets really yeah. complicated yeah <laughs> yeah that's right because you could put cts in there and 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 you would use split core cts to get it around the bus so you're not disconnecting the bus at all uh for low voltage we can do split uh split core cts for medium voltage we shy away from that so medium voltage uh, we can replace uh you know the one example i gave you you know we replaced you know 99 percent of the switch here we replace the cts as well Okay. Uh, and this is this is 19 I think the uh the date on the the drawings were it was 1964. Uh so that's the original 1964 switch gear that we are able to source brand new CTs for. Wow. Now, yep. you know, you know I have to ask the question. You said you shy away from split core at medium voltage. Why is that? Is it, is it an accuracy issue? Is it um what what is it? Oh, it's uh, so typically split core CTs are not uh not made for that application. Uh -huh. um, especially if you're going around bare bus bar, uh, is that, you know, 15 KV with, uh, you know, the split core CTs is we, yeah, we, okay. it, it, it's not, it's not the right application. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's a, it's yeah. more of a voltage rating and, and, the, and, and they don't make them at that voltage rating. They're all solid cores that you have to put over the bus. Exactly. I, exactly. I can buy that. I yep. can buy that. Yep. 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 But no, you're, you're right. So touch on your point. Like, you know, if you, uh, if there's any customers out there, that you know have that you know medium voltage switch here that it's you know relays from top to bottom because you have you know mm -hmm. distance relays differentials overcurrents you know you know zero sequencing uh, voltage relays all that can be combined in one relay okay so and santiago guzman says another question regarding new technologies what solutions would you hi i guess that means highlight regarding the logic of relays and and testing specifically especially the testing regarding the cost of injection equipment. I think, I'm not sure what he's talking about, whether he's talking about primary current injection testing, um, logic I of got, relays. I, so, I, so, could talk to, I could talk to both of them, I guess. Okay, so yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Voltage, yeah, so, uh, so if, if we're talking medium voltage relays, um, so one of, one of the things that we try to standardize on is when we do a modernization project and we go to uh, you know, a solid state digital relay is to make sure that we have test switches on the front of the door, right? Okay. So we don't have to take the breaker out of service. Obviously, we can isolate the relay by the test switches, and then we have you know, the test equipment that can put in the, you know, the secondary uh, current into the relay, not even secondary current, but secondary current and voltage or you know, kind of whatever it needs uh, to you know, taste, you know, uh, test the basic functions out of that relay. Right, right. Okay. Yep. So for low voltage application, now physically that breaker needs to come out of service because uh, you're, well, there's, there's two ways of doing it. One, but either way it needs to come out of service is that you're going to put primary current through it. So, you know, you take a low voltage breaker rate at 2000 amps, you're putting 2000 plus amps to the breaker to test it from a primary current uh, level. Um, and a lot of manufacturers nowadays make a secondary injection test set. 
which, uh, you know, it's, it's recommended that the breaker be taken out of service uh, just in case, you know, you accidentally trip it because there are no trip tests and there are trip tests. Right. Uh, but typically you want to take it out of service because you want to trip the breaker and make sure that, you know, the trip unit is, is sending the signals to, you know, the actuator inside the breaker and make sure that breaker does trip. Yeah, it's a and you want the mechanical to go to to actually occur. Now, the um, the primary current injection testing, especially in medium voltage applications, you're like you said earlier in the low voltage applications, the trip unit is a part of say the breaker. But in medium voltage, you've got separate CTs, and the polarity of the CTs and the current flow through the bus is a critical aspect. So I guess I would think outside of testing the polarity you would probably encourage primary current injection testing, even if it's low level currents, just to test all of the, the installation, right? I mean, I mean, you had to have, you had to have, you, you have, you have, um, what do they call that? Um, you have, you've been very intimate with the equipment. You have, yes. you've, you're intruding in, in every aspect you've, you, because you're putting, you're putting, uh, non-split core CTs on bus. So you didn't do that by uh, like the magician just doing the, and it was on, right? So you right. had to disconnect things. So uh, testing at that point is probably a lot easier than any time after that initial. Yeah, as long as it's de-energized and we can get in there and, and, and put primary current through the bus bar to test the polarity of the CTs, it should be done. That's part of, you know, when we do a modernization project is that's part of the commissioning process. Is that gotcha. hey? Not only we're we checking the CTs, the polarity, but we're also te- you know checking the wiring to the relay itself, right? And then also you know that wiring from the relay down to the breaker to make sure the breaker does trip. Yeah. Now, um, now, okay. So, and we just said that we are getting very. Um, um, we're doing a lot with the equipment, so. Uh, let me do this. There we go. So reconditioning an article. There were some new changes in the in the NEC with regard to reconditioning. The moment you start to get um, the way the definition says, if you if you restore a piece of equipment from a non functioning to an operating condition, which is not normal servicing, and what you're doing on medium voltage equipment is not normal servicing. You're 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 redoing a lot inside that equipment. It might not be with the low voltage assembly itself. It might just be with the circuit breaker. So when you do that, there are requirements in Article One Hundred and Ten, which I'm not sure if I have. I don't know if I have that slide here, but I'm just going to double check. Uh, I'd have to open up a different slide deck, but there there's a requirement in One Hundred and Ten for you to put your name on it. And you have to say the di- that like the date and the w- when it was reconditioned, remanufactured. So uh, and and any other rating. So do you relabel everything? If it was a GE breaker and you reconditioned it, do you put Eaton on it and and the date and all that good stuff? Change the nameplate information? No, we don't change the nameplate information. Um, but we do we do so all, all any any circuit breaker that comes through our reconditioning. It's we obviously, you know, do do you know the testing and the reconditioning to it, and then all that's logged through a kind of a, a software system that does a couple of things. Right, it tracks our records, uh, but also, you know, anything that we do carries a warranty uh, with with our work. Right, right? that's kind of the, the Eaton guarantee. Uh, and we will put a tested sticker on it that does label um, the, the the breaker and uh, when it comes uh, through through our shop and our office. Uh, but you know, changing out you know the, the other stuff, um, we yeah we we shy away from. Yeah. Now the um, I'm just looking for it because there is a yeah there it is. So there's a a new requirement in the 2020 code that basically tells us. Uh, you have equipment marking, you have filled, and I think it's in A. A2 is reconditioned equipment. And it says in here that reconditioned equipment shall be marked with the name, trademark, or other descriptive marking by which the organization responsible for reconditioning the electrical equipment can be identified along with the date of reconditioning. So now you also have to remove 
the existing listing mark. So and it has to be identified as reconditioned. And it says, and the original listing mark it needs to be removed. So, and in some cases, it has to be listed as reconditioned depending upon the breaker or depending upon the equipment. And we're seeing more of that in the National Electrical Code that says, you know, you have to list it as reconditioned. Um, but so when, when, when we, if we redo, uh, you know, a low voltage assembly, if we redo a circuit breaker, then um, it has to be identifiable that, that it was reconditioned and you, you provide all the documentation associated with it as well. That is correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 And yep. that's a critical, I think that's a critical piece. We, I guess your point is that information is very important because we, we now have a, a new warranty with that product. Right. And, yep. um, and, and, and it's more of a, a relationship with the customer with regard to the warranty aspect of it, as opposed to uh, um, any any other type of you know issue. Then I mean, it just has to be identified. That's all. That yeah, they, yeah. And then, and I think I think part of it is you know when we do a class one reconditioning on our circuit breaker, it comes back looking brand new, yeah. uh, and we don't want uh, anyone turning around and trying to sell those breakers uh, to 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 anyone else. Um, so you know, you know yeah, we want them listed as reconditioned. Yeah. Yep. Cool beans. All right. Yeah. Let's go back with this. I got to go back to my notes. All right. So low and medium voltage power circuit breakers. We know we cannot recondition molded case circuit breakers. Um, breaker to motor starter replacement. What's that about? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a kind of an application. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, many, many years ago when, you know, uh, people were just uh, low industries and facilities were installing medium voltage switch gear and they were starting and stopping motors with breakers. Right. Yeah. So that's an, that's an application problem. So now that's that's medium voltage and low voltage. So we have two solutions for that. We do have, you know, a medium voltage, the vacuum uh, motor starter, vacuum replacement motor starter. Uh, for for medium voltage and low voltage, so it's just matching up the application uh, to kind of the industry standard now, right? Because uh, yeah. breakers, yeah, breakers weren't made to you know you know start and stop motors you know day in and day out uh, for low voltage or medium voltage. So if you do have that application, you know we have a solution that can that can aid you with that. Yeah. So so you could take um, and I you know and I was just in a I was in a grow facility uh, not too far from here. Uh, a little bit ago, and they had a um, they had a Siemens breaker that had a mechanism on the front of it. They were using the breaker as a switch to turn all the lights on and off in the facility, and 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 and, and primarily had a lot of our equipment. But um, but the so so he he we were walking by it, and the door wouldn't close. Right, and I I looked at it. I said, well, what's this all about? And he says, well. He goes, you know, on all of the other lights, when when we engineered it with him, uh, we had a lot of contactors, and yeah. and actually he designed uh, boxes with uh, with contactors to turn the lights on and off. He says, but this one here, because you know, and the reason they had uh, a different manufacturer than anything else was because you know delivery, you know, they couldn't get they couldn't get the equipment quick enough, so they went with whomever they could get fast enough, and 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 they didn't have the contactors. So, so they were misapplying that breaker because they even said they contacted, uh, first he asked me, can I do that? And I said, well, I, in my awareness, I, it's not listed for that application to be used as to, to turn. I mean, they were turning that breaker on and off, like say six times a day. And I said, that, th that's not good, you know? And, and, um, and then he confirmed that with, uh, with Siemens that that, that breaker is not listed for that. So he, they have to fix that problem. Um, but to your point, in some cases, I, I never, I know, I never thought that medium voltage. They they use the medium voltage breaker as a starter. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah. I mean, it's, I've seen it, seen it a couple, a couple of uh, different yeah. applications. Um, even uh, even some generating facilities for utilities. I've seen it for their their ID wow. fans. And I've also seen those uh, those breakers fail before too. And oh, I'm going in. There. Oh yeah, and going in there and cleaning up the mess, uh, which uh, you ever see a medium voltage breaker fail and, and switch gear. It's it's. Uh, you know what <laughs> you know what I call that? You know, there's a there's a technical term. It's an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what it is. It's yeah. Now yeah. you mentioned vacuum. 
uh, interrupters uh, and using vacuum interrupters. Now, vacuum interrupters, can you can you just explain to everybody what a vacuum interrupter is? And then I think it's important for, because the vacuum interrupters operate pretty fast, they can cause transients in some cases, right? That can hurt that transformers. Yep. yep. And you got solutions for that. Yeah, so a vacuum interrupter is, is, is you know, pretty, you know, I would say, you know, simple technology, but what it does is it interrupts a fault or an arc under under a vacuum, right? right. Over a very short distance. Um, so, you know, comparing that to the old uh, air circuit breakers where air circuit breakers could need, you know, eight to 10 inches to interrupt uh, an arc or, you know, a fault, a uh, vacuum interrupter only takes you know a little bit of space, right? Mm -hmm. So you're saving you're saving well a couple of things. You're you're saving you don't need the arc chute on an old circuit breaker anymore. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so you're you're saving uh, saving a, a weight, um, and on top of you know the new technology. However, the downfall of a of a vacuum circuit breaker is it does cause transients on your system, right? Uh, that's been identified, and you know we do have criteria for when installing vacuum uh, vial circuit breakers. If there is any you know transformers that are you know close coupled to the electrical system or where the, the circuit breaker is at, that we do recommend a transient analysis or a transient study uh, in the case of need of, uh, of, of, you know, suppression, which would be the form of snubbers yeah. for that, uh, that device. Yep. you got yep. it. You yep. got it. Now, Santiago made a good statement. He says technology creating new ways for mankind to make more mistakes, you know, and you know what that reminds me of? Do you ever watch Jurassic Park? Did you ever see oh, Jurassic yeah. Park when, when, and I'm not sure, I can't remember the guy, I don't know the character's name, but the one guy says, he goes, he says, he knew that he could, but he didn't stop to think if he should, right? And, yeah, and, right. and and that's the key. I mean, there's a lot of technology and people in some, some and, and we all do this. I mean, we're, we all have got the MacGyver nature in us. You have a piece of equipment, you have a, a, a different application. And so we just try to think out of the box and, and put things together, put technology together to make something happen. But in that process, you end up misapplying uh, misapplying either a solution and medium voltage is not, I mean, even low voltage is not something you want to, you know, create an issue with, but I mean, medium voltage, I mean, that's voltage is pressure, right? Yeah. Voltage is pressure. And that's a heck of a lot of pressure and currents are much lower at medium voltage, but still, you can still have a very large boom um, when you, when you have that unintended rapid disassembly. Don Ganier has a question. Do vacuum breakers still have the radiation X-ray warning stickers? X-rays? Oh yeah, that's that's a, that's a great point. So I, I remember in my my testing days as a field service engineer, when we did high pots, uh, you know, perform that over potential test on the vacuum bottles just to make sure the vacuum uh, is is in the bottle. Is that you know there was warnings on uh, potential you know cause for uh, for you know radiation. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, we can probably get back to you on that. I don't know if that's still the case nowadays. Uh, that was, you know, so we go back to, hey, this is a, a new device and we're, we're going to do it. However, we didn't, you know, maybe we didn't uh, understand uh, that it was causing radiation or maybe someone thought it was. So maybe that's been, I want to say debunked, but I don't, I'm not sure if that is a concern anymore. But um, you know, I can follow up. I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, the, I, know, uh, I, on that one. I mean, just think about the technology. I mean, all it is, is a contact in a vacuum. Yeah. So, so that. I'm not sure where the x-ray factor would come from. Um, unless there's something I'm not aware of. I mean, it's just a, va it's just a contact in a, in, in a vacuum. So, and, and I loved your description. It, the contacts are much closer together. And then, and they can operate a lot faster because that gap is so small. And Don says you can create an X-ray by creating an arc in a vacuum. I think the ones I saw were thirty-four five kV. Well, you know what, Don, uh, that's challenge game on. So, what I might do, you know what, Jerry, what I think is I got to get, um, I got to get our vacuum guys. They're up in New York, right? Yeah, horses. You got it. I got to get uh, the guys from Horseheads. I got to do a program with them on vacuum uh, interrupters to understand that technology. And maybe I'll get a I'll cutaway. I always wanted a cutaway. Did you ever see those? They're, yeah. they're oh, cool. Yeah, they're awesome. Oh, those yeah. are cool. So um, maybe I'll, I'll get a cutaway out of that. I'll tell them 
I'll tell them I need to do a demo online and uh, we're going to have uh, 6,000 viewers and, and uh, all that jazz. Yeah, I wish uh, I wish I was prepared for that that question because we have those cutaways in uh, in Warndale here. I know you uh, do. Yeah, yeah, and, and really the technology is just that simple. I mean, it just pulls it apart under a vacuum and just you know distinguishes the arc. Yeah, and uh, you know what, Don Ganier, you know, I'd say is, uh, you know, just uh, every time you operate one of those, stand out in front of there, and and then uh, it'll print out a little X ray of your lungs and everything. It'll be a a Corona thing. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> free health care free healthcare, yeah. free healthcare <laughs> with every vacuum bottle sold <laughs> uh, but we will definitely look into that Don that's a good question and, and uh, that's the first I've heard of that so I just learned something all right so low and venum, 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 so so you said retrofill and I know we're going to have uh, let me just do this I know we um, you and I talked about um, um, uh, geez, you and I talked about uh, the schedule, right? Um, and yes. what we were, and and uh, we redid our list. And I thought one of these yeah, was on tomorrow. retrofill. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're, we want to cover retrofill, uh, retrofits, conversions. And really, how how IEEE plays a part with all that. Uh, so uh, Dean Sigmunds is going to be on on uh, <clears throat> on with me tomorrow. And Dean's, and if anybody has, has been around IEEE, they probably know the name Dean Sigmund. He's been he's one of the uh, uh, kind of the, the founders for you know IEEE C uh, thirty seven. Uh, he's he's on there. He's he's on the board. Um, you know, he he can answer a lot more technical questions than I can, and how all this kind of plays together from uh, from my triple E standpoint. Perfect. And then we can cover yeah, we can cover all three in, in detail and kind of what they mean to uh, the, the customers. Yep. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to learn the difference between a retrofill, retrofit reconditioned and all that other good stuff. And we're going to have the boss when it comes to, uh, to IEEE and the standards, because that's another that, you know, I, I, and I know I get electrical inspectors, uh, who may inspect a facility that, that has a retrofill or a retrofit or whatever of a circuit breakers. And, and they're going to have to come up with, how do I approve it? What are the what what are the references and how do I know what you're doing? And usually what we do is we look for standards, right? So yeah. whether it's, a, you know, uh, up until the 2020 code, a circuit breaker was not required by the code to be listed. OK, yeah. and we're in the okay. not the 2020 code, even the 2020 code doesn't require it. So it's the 2023 code that will require it if, you know, Knock on wood, everything goes goes the way it should. Go. It seems to be going, but yep. as of the code right now, there is no requirement in the NEC that a circuit breaker be listed. But many inspectors are going to look for that UL sticker or uh, ETL sticker or whatever the nationally recognized testing laboratory is, because that's their only way to verify that it will function as its function. Because otherwise, otherwise they're they're going to just you know, accept whatever it is at face value to say, okay, it looks like a circuit breaker. I'm going to say it's okay. They've got to approve it. So. Right. And you and, want to, and honestly, you want that peace of mind too. Yeah. Uh, so, so if any, anyone's out there, you know, thinking about, you know, retrofilling or, you know, replacement breakers or, you know, or, or whatnot, is that you want that peace of mind that, you know, the company that you're using is living up to these standards, whether it be IEEE or UL um, or NEC or, or, or NEMA is that, you know, we we built our our products to a standard, and we're and typically we build them over and above that standard. Uh, but you know, you all, um, you know, the listings and stuff like that. If we do come into a, a facility, uh, we do have the you know ability to bring UL in uh, to to take a look at our work also. Oh, so um, you can do a field evaluation. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And we've uh, there's select customers out there that, that that's in their specification, and we need to do that. Uh, so, you know, that's the other kind of peace of mind is, you know, you know, we we live up to a standards, but however, there's a third party organization to double check us. Yeah. Now, what you don't want to do is have the inspector during the inspection give you that tag and say, I want a field evaluation, because if you don't plan for that up front, it could probably I'm, I'm just taking a guess here. 
UL probably would want to be paid. Do you think? Oh yeah, yeah it's come, it comes at a cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you know what I always say: they love to stay at the best hotels and they love to eat at Chris, Ruth Chris Steakhouse for dinner. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, you're not, not going to get the listing for free. Unfortunately, <laughs> they're, they're nice people, but they're not that. <laughs> they're not that nice. <laughs> Just like you would not recondition it for free. So, or, or I'm sorry. Um, um, wait, wait a second. What's the term I'm supposed to use? Ooh, Renovate it. Right. Renovate, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So renovating is just like the whole umbrella, right? So renovating switch gear. And then mm-hmm. you get into, yeah, a little different, uh, you know, subparts of that reconditioning, refurbishment. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I, and I, and I, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, I want to say a lot. I've talked to some people who will say when, when, when there's areas like this, say whether or not the inspector is going to require a field evaluation. I'll, I'll always communicate, say, look, communication is best. Ask your inspecting agency what they're going to require before you get into it, even before you work up your go out for bids, right? I mean, because if we bid a project and, and, and our competitors bid projects and, and we get the order or, or whoever gets the order, if you come in after the fact and say, oh, hey, by the way, I need a field evaluation, that's not something you just throw in the recipe without saying without seeing it in a specification right yeah yeah and there's a lot of upfront planning for that i mean you have to submit drawings you have to do reviews they have to come out and do the inspection right so there's yeah there's a lot of upfront planning and we've had customers not from the ul standpoint but more of the electrical inspector is that you know we'll have a utility shut down a facility and then we'll we'll do our thing at the you know the service entrance and then we'll call the utility back and they will ask that question. Has the inspector been here to inspect it? And yeah. when we say no, they're like, well, we're not turning it back on. Right. So that's, uh, that's one yeah. of those things you need. You need to prepare for that up front. Yeah. And probably um, if it's not service equipment, because that's that's typically what happens when you when you kill the service and you, you, you know, pull the meter, tell the utility, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to redo this. They'll require that inspection or the HJ. When you're within a facility, though. You probably don't pull permits. I mean, like, like in my house, if I did something inside my house, especially in West Virginia, I mean, West Virginia doesn't inspect inside the home to begin with. So every jurisdiction will have different rules where right. some jurisdictions will say you need to pull a permit, even if you're going to change out a, a light inside your home. Right. And let alone in an industrial facility, changing out switch gear. But there's probably a lot of locations where you don't have to pull a permit. You don't have to notify anybody. The AHJ is really the plant manager. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. So it goes back to the uh, kind of the conversation is, you know, who do you trust on working on your switch gear in cases like that, right? Yeah. Someone that lives up to these standards or, um, you know, there's other organizations out there that will just come in and, and do their thing and get out, right? Yeah. And and you're hoping that it's, it stays online. So I'll, I'll probably have a hard time with Tommy D's restoration services out of my garage that's that's right i would i would not promote you at all <laughs> you wouldn't promote me come on i just got a miller welder so you know i'm i'm pretty proficient with oh, it i got a plasma oh. cutter the whole bit yeah i could i could work on switch gear you're ready to go maybe, i'm ready maybe to I'll, go uh, maybe i'll hire you yeah torque i don't need torque i weld everything <laughs> <laughs> you can weld copper believe me <laughs> done um so we talked about the doors we talked about um the snubbers and i know we've got some papers and i think it was um it was oh man the father of the arc reduction maintenance switch oh my gosh i can picture him anyway he wrote a lot of ieee papers in that regard um partial discharge Partial discharge, that is a, that's that's looking at uh, the condition of the equipment as it ages, right? You're looking for? Well, it's, 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 it's part of that. And uh, part of it, it's, it's real time. Um, that's the thing. So it's online active monitoring of your switch gear. For health. And we're, for health, yeah. So we're, we're going to cover that in day five. But, but quickly, that's one of the, I guess, hidden secrets out there is that, this, this device uh, measures, takes a look at, uh, you know, partial discharge in electrical system, uh, typically, you know, 
is it 2.4 kV and above, so medium voltage. Right. And it, and it gives you active online monitoring for your switchgear. So if there's an event or there's a problem internal your switchgear, um, your installation is starting to break down, uh, you're getting corona or discharge, or maybe you know something changed in humidity, uh, dust and dirt, and you start getting those those different frequencies in your electrical switchgear, yep. this device will pick that up and it will send a warning to you that, hey, something's wrong. You need to come in here, take a look at it, figure out what's wrong before you have a catastrophic failure. Excellent. And I know in uh, like I'm on NFPA 70B and we were talking about technologies like that to where if you if you know, if you have that insight to um, to your equipment, you might be able to change your maintenance schedules based upon data. So I, and I and, and I say change my maintenance schedules, I might because we talked about this on the panel. Um, because the, the immediate thought of everybody is, I don't want to have to pull maintenance like annually if I can get away without doing it this year, right? Because it's saving money. Yeah. But in reality, what we were talking about was more so when you ne might need to pull it earlier because you have an impending failure issue that you need to address. So it's not... Can I put it off? I mean, that is one aspect of it. Yeah. Can I, it. The other aspect is you might say, hey, look, I wasn't going to I wasn't planning to do this for another year. But it looks like based upon uh, my data that I might have to do it in six months. Yeah. Yeah. And really, that's, that's kind of a formula you put together. Right. So if you do, you know, these regular scheduled maintenances and outages as you're tracking costs. Right. So yeah. unplanned, you know, uh, um, not capital, but operational expenditures uh, to fix, you know, parts and pieces or replace this and that. And maybe that's that's really really low. And maybe your maintenance cycle is is too fast, right? So, but you want a peace of mind that hey, if you're going to skip a year, you know, how do I know my electrical equipment is not, you know, um, uh, going to fail on me or you know things are not, uh, you know, something in the system hasn't changed. And this is one of those devices that can help you with that. So you could yes, uh, actively maybe push maintenance. However, with online, you know, monitoring, if something would go wrong, then you can say, okay, hey, something's in the electrical system. We need to do a controlled shutdown to figure out what's what's going on. And that could be accomplished in, you know, one day, five days, maybe a month. Right. But mm -hmm. yeah. And then and then at some point, like uh, to your point, if you know the age of the equipment and you know and you have a good feeling for uh, the maintenance records, you 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 may get to a point to where you say, look, just like on my my my, my vehicle, we just bought a new vehicle. My wife had a yeah. uh, my wife had a Jeep Liberty, and I, you know I do all the maintenance on the on the vehicles, right? So when things break, I'm I'm out there fixing it. I just my F one fifty, I got the frame back up and running because I had I had a rusty frame, so that's when I learned how to weld, right? So uh, I got you know, yeah. I, I welded up my frame and everything. I got that truck inspected and it's all up and running. I'm hopefully going to get another hundred thousand miles out of it. But now my Jeep Liberty or her Jeep Liberty, it was nickel and diming me. And, and, and you know, it's not an F-150. It's like, it's a Jeep Liberty. I'm like, I'm not spending my time and money on trying to do this. So, so you know, we have been putting it off. And finally, we said, you know, let's just go out and buy a, a, a new vehicle. So we, we, had, we made the decision to purchase a new vehicle because we were looking at the condition of that, the reliability of that vehicle wasn't like I was going to say, hey, if I, you know, I have a company vehicle, but when we do personal trips, it's, it's, we like to take our own vehicle, but I, I needed a reliable vehicle for that regard. So we made the decision to buy a new vehicle. So you, they, you may, based upon the history, the condition, and all of your maintenance records say, look, this equipment is going to need an overhaul. Oh, overhaul. Oh, we got to have a go. TV program <laughs> overhaul, <laughs> overhaul your equipment overhaul. I'm telling you, you could paint it different colors. We can get chip foose in and paint the gear. That would be sweet. I'm telling you, yeah, we've, we, we've had requests for different colored gear before. So yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a real thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so we could, we could, uh, so in any case that, and and that's something like you said, you got to plan for, um, and you've yeah. got to, uh, you got to make sure that you are ahead of the game, staying up to date on your, on your maintenance so that you don't have an unplanned outage and downtime 
that because you know doing a doing medium voltage equipment doesn't take like a weekend, right? Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, it, it, it all depends, right? So it's <laughs> so the the the, the one uh, the, the one project that we work on uh, for it's a, a local university here in Pittsburgh is that. We fully renovated their switchgear. It was nine sections of old uh, Westinghouse DHP switchgear. This is the you know the 1964 uh, drawings that were uh, that were found. Uh, we we did it in five days. Five but days. Five days. Yes, five wow. days. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. So you take that and say, okay, I'm going to replace my switchgear. Um, you know, how long is that going to take? Well, wow, that's that's you got demo, you got temporary generators, you got you know, right, all this other. You, well, for this facility, it was ripping out a wall, uh, and, and like you know, that's that's you know, a month of of, of downtime, right? So, Absolutely. you take five days versus a month, and also the cost benefit of doing it was there too. Okay, so so the this week we've got uh, four, we've got. Tomorrow is retrofill and conversions and power system retrofits, right? So retrofits, retrofill, and conversions. Yes. Day three, which is Wednesday, is going to be reconditioning and uh, retrofit trip units. So did you have somebody in mind uh, outside of yourself and myself for that one? Um, I, I was going to, yeah, bring in one of our uh, our PBRC managers to okay. kind of talk through some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yep. And, and then, we can and we can get into more detail of class one, class two, and class three too, if we needed to. Oh, absolutely! Oh, yeah, yeah. we're going there, baby. <laughs> absolutely. Right. And and, like and then day four, which is Thursday, is panel shop. What's uh, so? What's that one going to be about? Yeah. So the panel shop, um, you know, really want to talk about like, hey, custom enclosures, uh, custom minute panels, and also, okay. you know, kind of the uh, we can do two things with uh, we are UL 508A listed panel shops. Right. So if we need to standardize and get it approved by UL. We have the ability to do that for the you know whatever you know customer facility, wherever location these panels are going. And it's a it's a engineered solution. Uh, that's that's the all also the part of it, right? So we've done some really really creative engineered solutions from a panel shop standpoint, from uh, utility sites to industrial sites. So whatever you can think of, uh, from mimic panels to putting PLCs and um, you know all these other you know wonderful ideas people have out there. You know, right. they have the ability to engineer a solution for that. Perfect. Okay, so yeah. we're gonna dig into that one, and then Friday. Friday at five o'clock. That is hardcore. I'm telling you right now, that is hardcore because, you know, I'm going to have a good bourbon and we're going to have to have a discussion around bourbon and scotch. OK, oh, all right. OK, we're going to really have good. to have bourbon night, um, but we're going to talk protective systems, partial discharge which you just mentioned, and remote yep. monitoring. Uh, and I think those and, and there's a, there's a lot of safety driven in in, I think, day five. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, the trip units, I mean, we're, you know, we're going to be talking about arc reduction, maintenance, switch, retrofitting into the, do you guys do, have you done anything with the quencher yet? No, no, that's, uh, that's, that's on our radar right now, but we have not from a retro, like retrofit application and yeah. existing switch here. Yeah. We are talking through that right now, but nothing has, uh, uh, you know, came to, uh, to light yet. Oh man, I'll tell yeah. you what, that, that's the cat's meow right there. I know it's an exciting technology. Yep. Absolutely. And we'll talk. So, so that's the layout. So today was just an overview to uh, yeah. get, calibrate everybody work. This is, uh, this is modernization week. This is uh, talking about taking existing equipment. This isn't about new solutions. This is about getting existing equipment up to speed. Some of it is new components, um, bringing it all up to speed. Tomorrow's power systems, retrofit, retrofilling and conversion. Wednesday is uh, trip units, reconditioning and retrofitting trip units. And then we got the panel shop discussion on Thursday. And then finally into partial discharge, remote monitoring. So that'll bring out the entire week on this. And uh, if there's any links, uh, Jerry, and I, and I know that I will be updating, I've updated my, uh, my calendar and, and in the notes for each of these sessions, I'm going to put some links and I put some links in for today's session. I have a couple videos uh, the one video is why modernization, like, is it right for you? Because I think it's a good discussion because everybody has to, and we just talked about it, everybody has to figure out when they're going to pull the trigger with regard to reconditioning or, re, you know, remanufacturing or, um, or doing their, um, 
they're renovating <laughs> the renovation, right? So, um, so we, we and 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 you've got to figure when you're going to pull that trigger uh, in that regard. So, uh, so I put the links to those and a couple other videos. Uh, in and 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 I know we have a brochure uh, that I put a link to as well, which talks about uh, all the different capabilities because everything that I've seen is not about the bus bar and the physical structure. It's about all the components that go in to that Absolutely equipment. Right. Yep, you got it, you got it. Okay, okay. Uh, what are we missing? Did I miss anything? Oh, the um, standards, IEEE. So we mentioned IEEE C37.59. Okay, yep. I don't, and that's something that if somebody wanted a copy of it, they'd probably have to purchase that from IEEE. I'm sure they don't just give that away. Um, and then um, IEEE C37.59 is one standard. And then the other was uh, 508A, so 508, UL5 industrial control panels. So that's going to be a point of discussion. ISO 9001-2015. What? The? ISO, isn't that quality standards? That's quality standards. Yes, that is correct. So. Yeah, down at our, uh, our, our our power breaker center in Greenwood, uh, that facility is ISO um, um, you know, certified, right? And there's a couple of different reasons for that. But the biggest one, I mean, is we, we focus on quality, right? So any product coming out of that facility is, you know, put through the rigor of ISO to make sure that we are following uh, that quality process. And on top of ISO, if anyone's uh, you know familiar with it, they come in and do audits every single year. Um, and, you know, we just went through our audits, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, no findings, you know, a couple, a couple areas for improvement, but uh, overall a very, very good, uh, well-run facility down there. Excellent. Yes. And Ryan Jackson says that um, he was, uh, he was the, uh, at the Pittsburgh Experience Center, an after hours tour. Uh, and I, and, and um, that experience center, I, and, and we also recondition breakers up there too, right? We do power circuit breakers. That is correct. Yeah. Yep. It's yeah. the same building. Yeah. So if anybody out there wants a, uh, a tour of the, you know, the, the uh, experience center, we have two. Uh, there's one here in Warrendale and one down in Houston. Yep. Uh, the one here in Warrendale, um, you can ask for a, uh, we'll call it a special uh, uh, you know, insight to my group, uh, which, you know, one of the panel shops uh, is here and also that our uh, breaker refurbishment center is here too. And also we do a lot of the custom items like the retrofills. Uh, right now we're working on a, uh, a generator application uh, um, for um, I can't. I guess I can't tell the uh, you know the, the customer, but out in uh, out in Washington. Um, so there are a couple of the uh, you know unique things that we do in this building. Okay, and what I'm going to do is um, I am going to at Eaton.com. I'm putting my email in here because if somebody out there says, "Hey, I'm going to be in Pittsburgh, or I'm down in Texas, or I'd love to get a tour." Um, yeah. or, or, or even attend some of our training. I know you, um, and, 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 uh, Mike King gave, we have a, we have a discount. If they go to eden.com slash electrical worker training, and they put in when they, uh, either an in-person or online training, if they put Eaton tech talk, all one word, they get a 10% discount, which I know is still valid. So, uh, but, but, um, if somebody's interested, I know we do training up at the experience center. Uh, in both locations um and if somebody wants to just you know go out and take a look at it you know send me an email i'll get you connected with the right people at either location and um would love and if you're in pittsburgh maybe we'll uh, we'll get a, a live tech talk from the experience center with a guest or a yeah. series of guests maybe we'll do we'll we'll broadcast a uh, training seminar or something that'd be awesome that'd be fun wouldn't it where are you yeah. are you out of are you out of the pittsburgh experience center Yes. Yep. That's, yep. I'm up here in Warrendale. And then, uh, yeah. So tonight, or it's actually tomorrow morning, I'm flying down to Greenwood. So I'll be, uh, I'll be live from Greenwood tomorrow oh, at the cool. uh, Power Breaker Center. Yep. For the next uh, few days. And then That's I'm flying sweet. back Thursday night and be back in Warrendale. For, what time's uh, your for, flight uh, on Thursday? I, I have not scheduled it just yet. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, boy. I'm sweating bullets, man. I'm sweating bullets. <laughs> I might, I might be doing this from the airport. We'll see. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Don Ganeer <laughs> asked about the Experience Center tours associated with the Eaton section, the Eastern section meeting. So Don, we were actually going to do a portion of the Eastern section meeting in the Warrendale location. 
That I think is falling through because of the number of people and logistics. But if you're coming in for the Eastern section meeting and you uh, are either gonna come in early or you're gonna stay late, because I think the Eastern section stops on Sunday. Um, if you're gonna stick around on Monday, let me know and we could probably get you up there to the Experience Center. I know the COVID stuff is starting to ramp up again. Um, so the sooner you let me know, the, the better chance I have of giving you the thumbs up or the thumbs down with regard to uh, getting in there around that Eastern section meeting. I think things, you know, I, as long as it's not like 300 people or 30 people or 60 people, it's an easier chance of getting a, a good tour. But I'm going to be at the Western section meeting right afterwards. So, um, but in any case, Dawn, we, we definitely tried to do that because it is here in Pittsburgh. I don't know if you, Jerry, you're familiar with the International Association of Electrical Inspectors has okay. a section meeting in Pittsburgh this year, which uh, we, they, they do a, every year we do a, a, a section meeting. We bring inspectors, contractors, designers all get together and we talk about code. We have a program, an education program. They do CEU credits for with it. And uh, this year it happens to be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They're doing oh, a awesome. gateway clipper. They're doing a gateway clipper boat ride. It's not a Missouri boat ride. It's a gateway clipper ride. They actually bring it back. So, uh, and it's like a dinner, like an evening thing. So, but oh, that's uh, great. Yeah. That's uh, Pittsburgh's a beautiful city. So enjoy sure it. Is. Sure is. Okay. Did we miss anything? No, I think we, uh, we, we covered the highlights of, of today. Um, Talked about all the products, talked about, uh, you know, all the, all the different codes, and we'll get into more, I guess, deep dives tomorrow and throughout the week. But yeah. Um, yeah, and we did mention that the commissioning is a key part of all of this, and I would hope, and I know I'm going to be pressing for it, that during our discussions this week, I'm gonna, we, we will be talking about the commissioning that goes on uh, for each of the stages, so whether it be a trip unit uh, whatever it is that we would do. So uh, we can talk about the tests and the commissioning uh, at the installation. So I think that'll be a, a good discussion for each of those sessions. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. That's perfect. All right. I know we try to keep them to an hour, no more than a two hours, but we've been going an hour and 20 minutes. And we've got guys like Don Ganeer and the crew still hanging in there. I'm going to make sure I didn't miss any questions. Gustavo Chavez, thanks for joining us. Oh, we got Felix Sandoval and David Engelhart saying good night. Thank you, David, for tuning in. Uh, Gustavo, you know, we, we are international. So does it matter? I mean, do you do this stuff in like Colombia, um, you know, South America? Do you do this stuff in other countries? Yeah, yeah. So we we do. We uh, we we have an international. Uh, we do provide a lot of products for our international customers. Uh, but it also depends on um, you know I, I guess where you're at. So we do have a modernization service that's in uh, that is in Europe. Uh, so if anyone out there in the phone needs uh, you know contact information, and Tom, I could probably send it to you. Uh, if, yeah, please. You know, if someone needs uh, that type of service or any contacts, I can get that over to you. So you can uh, so anyone out there can contact them. That's what we'll do. And I'll make sure I put that in the um, I'll, I'll put links uh, to like finding a service and whatnot in the notes for each of our sessions. So, yeah, yeah. And I guess I didn't realize how how uh, broad the audience would be. Right. So I think it, it may yeah. be good to, uh, to to provide a link if uh, anyone in, in South America um, needs like contact information of like who to reach out to and Eaton to, you know, get a hold of our group or get information. So I can, I can get that out to, to you too. too Tom. That'd be perfect. And I'll make sure I put that. Cause we do, we, we get, uh, we get Japan, we get uh, Colombia, we got Mexico. Um, trying to think of other Ireland. We got Ireland. Um, I got to I got to I always have to pop a Guinness whenever I get those guys on the online. So, um, but yeah, so we do get, we do get an international play with regard to the channel. So that's a good thing. And we are an international company. So that's right. Nothing wrong with that. All okay. right. Um, I don't know that we, do we have anything else that we missed? Anything else you want to cover before we close up shop? Let's see. No, I think we got most of it. And being all week, I'm sure that we will definitely cover all of it. Yeah, and I would, yeah, and I will make sure that if anybody has any specific questions 
on this topic, regardless, you know, it, as we go through each day, we're going to have the right people engaged. So uh, please uh, send your questions in. I'll make sure that we get them answered uh, for in these sessions. And, uh, you know, regardless of the topic, I mean, we could be talking, we could be talking control panels, but we're going to have Jerry. So uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll definitely be able to uh, field the questions and, um, and answer them regardless of the topic. So that'll be perfect. Cool beans. Nice. Well, Jerry, I appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your, uh, your evening. Oh, no problem. Anytime. Uh, anything I can do to promote our business and help our customers. Uh, Tom, appreciate your time and uh, anyone, yep. all the people that, uh, that are listening in. Thank you uh, for everything. Hopefully you got something out of this and you know, hopefully we can, uh, we can get you back for the next you know, couple days to. Oh, the end yes. Of the week. Yes, I mean, they, they, this is just the this is just the sets us up because we're going to get into some great technical details each day and uh, answer as many questions as we can. So, Ryan Jackson always brings some good dialogue. Clayton Lima, thanks for joining in, and send me an email. And uh, if anybody out there wants to get in contact with our services, anybody thinking about uh, you know reconditioning, trying to figure out when to do that, uh, how to do that, that's what this week is all about. It's uh, it is going to be modernization 101, and then we're going to get into the details. So, yeah. cool beans. Well, I appreciate it, sir. I appreciate it. All right. All right, man. No. Well, I want to tell everybody out there, so thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jerry, again. Um, like the, I enjoyed the discussion. We'll have a great week, and I know that everybody out there is going to be tuning in and sending me questions. I appreciate everybody out there, what you do for electrical safety and the industry. Please keep on doing it and please keep coming back. Don't forget, hit the thumbs up, right? And subscribe. I always forget that. And and these guys tell me about it. And, and, I, and, and I learn a new trick. Jerry, if you're ever out there on YouTube and you want to give somebody the thumbs down, you got to click it twice. Oh, okay. Yeah, you always got to <laughs> click it twice. <laughs> so it, it took me a minute, but I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got to click it twice. So uh, I appreciate that. All right, everybody, I'm going to we're going to shut this. Uh, we're going to shut the feed down and uh, looking forward to talking to everybody tomorrow at five o'clock. Mr. Abbasi, Mather Abbasi, thanks for joining in New York City, buddy. Um, you know, I know you guys experience water and all that good stuff out there. Hopefully uh, the hurricanes don't hit you hard this year. Uh, but if you do, you know who to call. So let us know and we will uh, give you as much information as we can. So thanks for joining in, Matt. And I uh, look forward to seeing you on panel two. We're going to get our task group works going. All right, everybody. Good night. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> All right. I'm going to shut the feed down. All right, everybody. Take care. Stay safe and stay healthy. <laughs>